Hello everyone and welcome to your November 4-H club meeting. The month of November serves as a great reminder of the many positive things happening in our lives, even through the pandemic. So remember to take some time this month to be with your family and to give thanks. During this month's 4-H lesson, we will be exploring the world of watersheds and learning about how we can prevent water pollution. But before we begin, let's go over a few reminders and talk about all of the fun upcoming 4-H events you can participate in. Let's take a moment to affirm our commitment to using the 4-H's to make our world a better place by reciting the 4-H pledge. Please stand as your class officer leads you in the pledge. Here are some important links to all of the November information we're going to talk about. First, we have the direct link to our newsletter. Second, we have our activity folder that has all of the November flyers you have in front of you, as well as any forms you'll need for contests. And lastly is our calendar. Have your parents go here to check out our Google Calendar. Please note that if you try to access the activity folder to look at the flyers, you cannot be logged into your student ccboe.net account. It will not let you in. However, you do not have to be logged into any Google account to access this folder. Here are some important 4-H reminders and announcements. If you sold pecans in our pecan fundraiser, you must pick up your orders November 16th from 3 to 7 p.m. at the Columbia County Extension Office in Appling. Students are responsible for picking up their entire order and then delivering individual orders to their customers. Customers may not pick up individual orders from a larger order. If you have any questions, please call our office. If you still have a fair exhibit project at our office, please make sure you come and pick it up as soon as possible. Projects left for more than two weeks will be thrown away. We don't want to throw away your beautiful pieces of art, and you may have prize-winning money to pick up as well. A note for our Mars Base Camp 4-H STEM Challenge. It is full at this time with a wait list, and we are not accepting any new registrations. Don't forget about our fire prevention donation drive. The top 10 fifth grade classes who raise the most money will win a cupcake party in February. Fifth graders, please bring your donations to the classroom by November 29th. Make sure that all money and change is secure in either a Ziploc bag or an envelope. Please do not put money in plastic jars that cannot be opened or milk jugs. All containers must have the school's name and the teacher's name name labeled on it clearly. We got a question last month about the average cost of a smoke detector. Most smoke detectors cost between 10 and $20. So as you're collecting money, think about how many smoke detectors you could buy with the donations you're collecting. We still have 4-H t-shirts for sale, but supplies are running low. We do have some additional t-shirts to offer. We have blue, gray, and green short sleeve shirts available for $5 and long sleeve maroon available for $8. Here are the sizes that we have left. Please have a parent call before ordering or coming by the office. Below is an updated order form link with the new t-shirts as well as the sizes that are currently available. Congratulations to our October contest winners. We had a ton of beautiful entries for our Universe of Art contest. Our winners are in the division of kindergarten through third, Jackson Vaughn from Baker Place Elementary. And in divisions for fourth through sixth grade, we had first place Bella Bridges from North Harlem Elementary in Miss Forney's class, and second place to Brianna Bailey in North Columbia Elementary in Miss Garner's class. We also have calculated all of those pop tabs. We had over 400 pounds of pop tabs turned in. You guys are awesome. Our top 10 pop tab winners are as follows. These 10 classes will receive a pizza party in December. 10th place, we have North Harlem Elementary, Miss Fitzgerald's class. And 9th place, we have North Columbia Elementary, Miss Hardison's class. In eighth place, we have North Harlem Elementary, Ms. Lazenby's class. In seventh place, we have North Columbia Elementary, Ms. Bazell's class. Sixth place, we have Parkway Elementary, Ms. Williams' class. In fifth grade, we have Brookwood Elementary, Ms. Brewer's class. Fourth place goes to Westmont, Ms. Sutton's class. Third place goes to Westmont, Ms. Short's class with 37.13 pounds. 
In second place, we have Riverside Elementary, Miss Ball, with 34.06 pounds. And at number one, we have North Hallam Elementary, Miss Forney's class, with 48.3 pounds. You guys did an awesome job. Next, we have also determined our top three pecan sellers. In third place, we have Livy Williamson from Columbia Middle School, who sold 42 units of pecans. In second place, we have Madeline Hawthorne from Miss Lazen's Lazenby's class at North Hallam Elementary with 52 units of pecans um, sold. And in first place, we have Jessica Meadows from Lakeside Middle School who sold 83 units of pecans. Congratulations to all our winners, and we really appreciate all of your hard work. With all of the points we've added for fair exhibits, pop tabs, and all of the wonderful things you've been doing, we wanted to update you guys on our current top 10 clover point totals. If your class is in the top 10 for total clover points at this time, congratulations. Keep up the good work. And even if you're not in the top 10 now, that's okay. We still have a lot of the 4-H year to go and a lot of points to still earn. This month's contest is designing a holiday card. Design the official Columbia County Extension holiday card. The winning card will be sent to county officials and community members during the month of December. The theme for the card should be general holidays or the winter. It must be hand drawn. No digital entries will be accepted. It must include the 4-H emblem as well. The emblem, however, can be digital. We realize it is pretty hard to draw. And it must also be on eight and a half by 11 white paper. The entry this this month is not on Google Forms. It is a paper entry that you received from your teacher at the start of this meeting. If you need an extra copy, it's available at the URL on this slide. The deadline to enter is December 1st. Congratulations to all of the Hay Bale Decorating Contest Club participants at the fairgrounds. We appreciate all the hard work the students and the teachers put into this last minute event we sure had a great time, and you guys sure are creative. It was really hard to pick a winner. Members of the Columbia County Merchants Association took a good hard look at all of the entries, and the winner was North Harlem Elementary with their creative barn scene. Each participating club received a donation from the Columbia County Merchants Association, and the winning club received an additional donation. We would like to thank the sponsors of this contest. Senator Lee Anderson graciously provided the hay bales and the Columbia County Merchants Association provided the monetary donations for the participants. Congratulations to everybody and we hope to do this contest again next year. We are so excited to announce this month that you have the chance to win a free trip to 4-H camp this summer. You heard me right, a free trip to camp. All you have to do is sell raffle tickets in our winter fundraiser raffle. This is open to grades 4 through 12th, and for every 10 tickets you sell, your name will be entered into a drawing to win a full summer camp scholarship. The top seller selling the most raffle tickets will also automatically receive a camp scholarship as well. Tickets are $15 or 4 for $50. When people enter the raffle, they have a chance to win a brand new RecTech grill valued at $600, as well as a family photo session or professional carpet cleaning. Make sure your customers enter your name onto the raffle entry. The entries are done all online. There is no physical ticket. Make sure you also check out the raffle info cards provided to you this month along with your flyer for more information. These info cards are ready to print and create to give to your customers. That way they'll know exactly what name to put in when they buy their raffle ticket. This is the way that we will know who has sold which tickets. Please make sure they know to enter your name in their raffle entry online. The deadline for your customers to purchase tickets is December 30th. Drawing for prizes and scholarships will be held on New Year's Day via Facebook Live. If you have any questions, please call our office. There are so many awesome things going on this month in 4-H, and I can't wait to tell you about our overnight trip to Rock Eagle in February. You'll get the chance to stay overnight in an awesome cabin at Rock Eagle 4-H Center. We'll have a pizza party, a DJ and a dance, and you'll get to hang out with your friends. 
You'll also compete with other 4-H'ers around the state in a public speaking activity called Cloverleaf District Project Achievement, or DPA. You'll learn how to research, development, and present a five-minute show-and-tell project using posters and props on a topic that interests you. All 4-H'ers will see, receive a medallion for participating and will also have a special awards program for first, second, and third place winners. Event registration opens on November 19th, and the best part is it only costs $35. This event is open to grades 4 through 6 as well, so if you have any friends in 4th or 6th grade, they could participate too. Before registering via Eventbrite, use the link provided below as well as the one provided on your flyer you received this month to go through the projects and objectives list to choose an area that you might want to talk about. Try to choose five areas first that you're interested in. Then when you register, you'll be asked to put in your number one choice. If that project is full, that's okay. Go down the list and put in your second one, and it will tell you if it's open or not. Try to pick a topic that you are interested in and you think you could talk about for five minutes. Registration closes on January 8th on Eventbrite. The link to register is also on the flyer you received this month. If you have any questions, please call our office. We are so excited about Cloverleaf DPA. This is one of the biggest events we do every year, and we're so excited to have you guys with us. It's question time. You guys came up with some awesome questions about our October lesson on pollinators and insect classification. At Riverside in Ms. Childress's class, they asked a couple questions about mimic butterflies. Where can the monarch butterfly copycats be found? As we talked about in our presentation, viceroys mimic the monarch butterfly. They can be found in Canada to northern Mexico and from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean, pretty much anywhere in the continental United States. They're typically found in moist areas around lakes, swamps, and meadows. They also asked if there was more than one copycat or mimic butterfly for the monarch. There is not another true mimic for the monarch butterfly. However, there are several that have similar colors and are often mistaken for as a monarch, such as the painted lady, seen to the right, and the queen butterfly. Both of these have spots on them like the monarch and are orange, black, and yellow like a monarch as well. Next, we have a couple of questions from Greenbrier Elementary. What classification is the worm in? That's a great question. We talked about insects and other creepy crawlies, but we never talked about worms. Worms include many different distantly related animals that typically have a long cylindrical tube-like body, no limbs, and no eyes. And they're classified into three major phyla or groups, flatworms, roundworms, and segmented worms. Worms get a little wormy though. They don't all fit in a single category. Our last question was, why do butterflies see only in UV light? Butterflies have light-sensing cells that allow them to see in UV light. Most butterflies typically have six or more types of light-sensing cells, but scientists have found that the swallowtail butterfly species has at least 15, which is actually the most out of any insect that has the light-sensing cells in their eyes. That's pretty incredible. Think about some questions you have during this month's lesson and have your teacher submit them to me and I may answer them during December's lesson. It's finally time to get started with our November lesson, Where the Water Flows. A raindrop's journey has just begun once it falls from the sky. Have you ever thought about what happens to water once it falls to the ground? Some of the first words that come to my mind are rain, drinking water, lakes, and even life. Today we'll be learning about watersheds, storm water, as well as water pollution, and how water affects our daily lives. Before we talk more about what happens when water flows, let's review how water moves by watching a short video reviewing the water cycle.
As we just saw, the water cycle is the path that all water follows as it moves around the earth in different states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. When water falls from the sky as rain, snow, or hail, we call that precipitation. That is either in a liquid or solid state of matter. Next, we have infiltration. When precipitation falls from the sky, it can be absorbed through the ground. When underneath the ground, it can accumulate in something called an aquifer, which is where we get a lot of our groundwater, which we use for drinking. This is a liquid state of matter. Next, we have evaporation. When precipitation falls from the sky, water gathers in lakes and rivers and other low-lying areas. When the sun heats up, that water can be evaporated as a gas into the sky. Transpiration is also when water goes from a liquid state to a gas state, but this happens through plants. Plants absorb the water and then transpiration happens and is released from the plant as a gas or a water vapor. This water vapor then goes into the sky and causes condensation in the formation of clouds. Condensation is when the water vapor goes from its gas state and turns back into a liquid state. Once the condensation happens and the clouds get heavy, rain, snow, and hail falls from the sky again as precipitation and the cycle goes on. When water falls back down to the surface as a liquid, how it flows depends on the area's watershed. A watershed is an area of land that contains a common set of streams and rivers that all drain into a single larger body of water, such as a river, a lake, or an ocean. Let's learn a little bit more about watersheds as we watch this video. The Kokoraz Educational Series is proud to present Watersheds. Do you live on land? No! 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 Arr, arr. no. Well, if you're not like these guys and you live on land, Guess what? You are living in a watershed. Now, a watershed isn't this, or this, or this. And it's definitely not to be confused with a water closet, which is an old-timey term for a bathroom. Hmm. <laughs> no, a watershed is an area of land where surface water drains down to a single point, be it a stream, lake, or ocean. A watershed, also called a drainage basin, collects all of the water that doesn't first get evaporated or transpired, whether it's from rain, snow and ice melt, sprinklers, spilt slushies, or even... Oh, yes, my old nemesis, water balloons. It's like a big funnel that drains down to one spot. The area of a watershed is defined by topography, the shape of the land. Its borders are marked by the drainage divide, the highest ridge that divides the water from falling into its own basin rather than that of another. To visualize it better, Let's take a look at this roof and its gutters. The rain that falls on each side ends up draining into its own gutter. The drainage divide is marked by the peaks of the roof, and each section could be considered a watershed. The area of a watershed is also defined by what common source of water it flows into. Jennifer lives in a watershed that flows into a nearby stream. That watershed, along with neighboring watersheds, make up an even bigger watershed. Made up of other neighboring watersheds, that make up an even bigger watershed. You see how this could be pretty confusing, but luckily we have an easy way to classify watersheds. We use HUCs, or Hydrological Unit Codes, which is just the fancy name we use for a watershed address. Think of it like a jigsaw puzzle. The first number represents one piece of a puzzle made up with relatively few pieces. The second number represents a more complex puzzle with even more pieces. You can keep breaking up the puzzle into more and more pieces until you get your full address. This is Jennifer's address. But no matter where you live, it's in a watershed. Arr! Arr! Right, right, right. I'm not talking about you guys. Looking at these maps, you can really start to understand why it is so important to know exactly how much precipitation falls in what specific areas. Take McNamee Peak in Colorado, for example. You could have three raindrops fall within just a few feet of each other, but end up in completely separate watersheds. Those few feet could end up in differences of hundreds and hundreds of miles. 
This is why having lots of precipitation measurements over a wide area is so important. At Kokoraz, volunteers just like you contribute precipitation data that allows water managers to better calculate how much water they can expect in their basin. While a single measurement of 0.3 inches doesn't seem like much, when it's averaged and multiplied over a large area with all the other data, it can start to add up quickly. Let's go back to our roof example to see how much water could be collected from a small rain shower. As explained earlier, there are three different watersheds, meaning three different places where the water runs off the roof. Let's look at the front watershed. 30 feet by 10 feet equals 300 square feet of roof. Let's say that it rains a half an inch over this house. On this watershed, that ends up being over 93 gallons of water. Now think about the same thing on a larger scale. Even over a small watershed, if the entire amount of rainfall washed downstream, it might be enough water to fill up a stadium. A watershed is a basin-like landform defined by high points, ridge lines, and valleys that are created by the surrounding landforms. Landforms are a result of a combination of constructive and destructive forces. Constructive forces build up features on the surface of the earth. These include mountains through the process of deformation and deltas through deposition. Destructive forces break down features on the earth's surface, like the creation of canyons through the processes of weathering and erosion. We have many types of landforms in the five geographic regions of Georgia. In North Georgia, we have the Blue Ridge, Valley Ridge, and the Appalachian Plateau regions. As their name suggests, these regions include many valleys, ridges, and mountains. In Middle Georgia, we have the Piedmont. The Piedmont region is vast rolling hills. These include places like Stone Mountain. In Southern Georgia, we have the Coastal Plain region. Coastal Plain is flat and sandy and includes landforms such as deltas and islands near the coast. Next, let's test your landform knowledge by playing Legendary Landforms on quizzes. Georgia has 14 major watersheds. These are also sometimes called basins. Let's find out what watershed we are in. Here is Columbia County. According to this map, what watershed do you think we are part of? That's right, we are part of the Savannah River watershed. The Savannah River forms the border between the states of Georgia and South Carolina. It begins in Appalachia and ends at the Atlantic Ocean, covering 10,577 square miles. The river also provides drinking water to approximately 1.4 million people that live in Augusta and Savannah. The Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA for short, has a website to help people find their specific waterways and watersheds. Here is a snapshot of the waterways in Columbia County. Some of these waterways include Kyogi Creek near Appling and Uchi Creek that begins in Harlem and flows through Evans. If you look at the map closely, you'll see that all of these smaller waterways eventually flow into the Savannah River watershed. If you have time, you can use the link to this site to type in your home address or school to see what waterways are nearest you. A lot can happen between when water falls to the ground and when it flows into our waterways and watersheds. What happens in between is called storm water runoff. If we aren't careful, this runoff can also carry pollution into our water sources. Let's watch a video to learn more about storm water and ways to prevent water pollution. Hi there, I'm Freddy. Welcome to my home. Sorry about all the mess. It may be raining up there. But down here, I'm dodging litter! Have you ever seen litter in the creek, river, or lake and wondered how it got there? I used to, and then I discovered that it gets carried here with the stormwater. What is stormwater, you ask? Stormwater is simply rainwater after it hits the ground. Easy enough. Okay, who 
knows what this is? That's a storm drain. What about this? Yep, another storm drain. You see, a storm drain's job is to keep the streets from flooding when it rains. But where does all that water go? Storm drains carry the water away from the streets and parking lots into the nearest creek, river, or lake, which is where I live. Now, these drains are different from the drains inside your home that carry wastewater from your sink, shower, and toilet. Those drains connect to pipes that go into the sewer system and to a huge cleaning facility where the water is cleaned and treated before it's released into the stream. But storm drains send water straight into the creek, river, or lake. That water doesn't get cleaned. These two drains are not the same. Only rain should go down the storm drain. Say that with me. Only rain down the storm drain. 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 Now that we know more about storm water, let's learn more about how that water flows through our cities. This month we have two very special guests joining us from the Columbia County Storm Water Utility Department, Ms. Margaret Alligood and Ms. Rachel Osborne. They work to educate about and manage water pollution within our county. Today they will be showing us how different types of pollution affect our environment using an Enviroscape model. Listen closely because some of this information might be on your lesson assessment at the end of the meeting. Hello everybody, I'm Marguerite Alligood. I'm with Columbia County Stormwater and Environmental. This is Rachel Osborne, my counterpart, and we're here to talk to you about watersheds and also pollution prevention to them to keep our drinking water safe and plentiful. So let's talk about water. Our passion is water. Uh, there's only so much of it. So we wanna make sure we protect it. And that way we have plenty of water, a long, long time to drink and to keep us all alive. The watershed, when it rains, water flows downhill. And it goes to a, in our neighborhoods, we may have a different watershed depending on where that low point is. So let's, Miss Rachel, demonstrate what happens if everybody acts right. We have gorgeous, clean drinking water flowing back. The water experts don't have to do much to clean it up before they send it to our faucets. Now, let's talk about this factory over here. It is supposed to dispose of its chemicals or toxins off to a garbage plant, just for lack of uh, simple words to understand. If it doesn't follow those laws and it has pollutants on it, let's show them what happens when it rains to our drinking water sources. Remember that water tab is back down. Do you want to swim in that? That's Strom Thurmond or Clark's Hill where you go swimming and maybe cook hot dogs by one day. <laughs> the fish are there, the aquatic life. They don't want to swim in that. They can't survive in that, can they? No, they cannot. So that's point source pollution. And you want to explain why it's called that? A simple way to remember it? Because you can point to it. That's you right. You know where it's coming from. Uh, next, we're going to talk about non-point source pollution. And that's a little bit more tricky. You can't just point to it. Usually it's a collection of a bunch of uh, pollutant sources that are coming together and affecting our water body. So let's talk a little bit about some different ones that we might have. Let's think of your house. Your parents might like to have a nice clean lawn. So they might put pesticides and herbicides and uh, fertilizers on the lawn to keep it green and to keep it healthy. But sometimes you can put too much of it on there, and then whenever it rains, it's gonna go out into the water body. Think of your pet. Uh, everybody who has a pet knows that it's a big responsibility, and they like to go to the bathroom in your yard or when you go on a walk. You need to make sure that you're cleaning up after your pet and being responsible because those uh, little presents in your yard can actually end up back into the waterways as well. 
Yes, and we're so excited because uh, our area just got awarded uh, the number one place to live in the country. That is so exciting for y'all, us. Uh, I already knew it because I just love when I'm driving around. I just think we live in the most gorgeous area. So many people are moving here. Uh, so many houses you see being built. The reason why is because it is a wonderful place to live thanks to your teachers and thanks to a wonderful water supply. Now, with those people come more pets, right? Mm. So we gotta make sure that doesn't make back to our drinking water. Uh, and when you're walking in your neighborhood, you see the storm drains on the side of the road. Well, what our experts are finding is people are doing great. They're picking up that dog waste. You never touch it, it's E. coli, which means it's a bad bacteria that can make you sick. So you never touch it. You let a guardian or adult uh, parent show you how to dispose of it. But a lot of adults are getting the dog waste, walking in the neighborhood, and this should go back to the trash can, but for some reason, some people are throwing it down that drain. Mm -hmm. Now, does that go straight to the water experts to be cleaned up before the fish no. are having to swim in it? It goes straight to our water source. Yes, back to our drinking water supply and back to the fish and harming them possibly. Right. So we want to make sure any garbage goes back to a trash can and that only clear water goes down here. Rain and clear water, not even washing cars with soapy water in it should go down the storm drains. And the other thing I want to touch base, Marguerite said that, you know, we have a lot of people coming and moving to Columbia County. Well, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of construction sites going on. And actually the number one pollutant in our community and in the state of Georgia is sediment or soil. Yeah. So, so the builder comes in and removes mm -hmm. that top grass, for instance, and then that makes the soil loose there. And the inspectors go out to make sure they put up protective barriers so it doesn't flood back to our drinking water resources. Because this is what happens. Do you see the toxins going right into our drinking water and to the, where the fish live and to where we swim? Do any of y'all want to swim in there? I don't think so. <laughs> So we have thrown a lot at you. Uh, during this, when the uh, soil goes down, it may cause juts and the, that uh, silt or sediment. People think because something's natural um, that that silt won't harm the drinking water. Some people blow leaves down the storm drain. Now, if a leaf or two falls down, it's fine, but if it clumps up and it's a lot, it's not okay. The fish can't breathe just like we can't in these masks. <laughs> so, but they protect us, so we wear them. Um, so the big take home message is that you can have an impact on your local drinking water source mm -hmm. by doing things like picking up after your pet, uh, talking to your parents about how the storm drains go directly to our water source, or even... Yeah, that you can help so much the minute this video ends, the minute you step outside your classrooms by any garbage, uh, any styrofoam cups, try to use them sparingly, try to use a drinking glass so there's less trash in the world. Don't be throwing it out on the ground or out the car or anything. Make sure it makes it back to a trash can. That's what you can help with most and spread the word about things going down storm drains should only be clear water. Now we want to send you a kit. We partner uh, with 4-H, which we really appreciate all that they do with the youth and, and the teachers do for our youth in our area. We have sent you and sponsored sending you this watershed kit that you can build yourself of a smaller model of this. You'll get a piece of wax paper. You don't want to crumple it up real hard, just gently and your teacher will show you how, and you place it in your watershed area. Now you see where you have mountains and valleys, and here could be Clark's Hill or Strom Thurmond, and you take your marker and act like it's a pollutant, or dog waste. Then I'm gonna let your teacher show you, because she received a, a water bottle, and she will show you when it rains what happens with that. I'll let it be a surprise. And she also has different pollutants that she can demonstrate this very same thing with.
So we hope that you enjoy this and that you enjoy what 4-H brings you and that your teachers bring you daily. We're so thankful for them. We want to leave you with please prevent pollution and only rain down the storm drains. Wasn't that demonstration awesome? Who knew a little bit of pollution could go so far? Let's review how you can help prevent water pollution. Don't litter. Place litter either into the recycling bin or a trash can. Never throw it on the ground or put it down the storm drain. Remember, only rain down the storm drain. After mowing the lawn or trimming your landscape, throw your yard clippings into a compost pile. That way they are broken down and recycled as soil that can be used later on. Never compost clippings that have pesticides sprayed on them though. Bag those up and set them out to be collected with your trash. Next, always pick up after your pets. Attach disposable bags to your dog's leash so you always have a way to clean up. You are putting humans and other people's pets at risk of being exposed to harmful bacteria when you don't pick up after your pets. Now that we know about ways to prevent water pollution, let's get hands-on and create our very own watershed in your classroom. Let's build a watershed. This month, you are supplied with all of the materials needed to make your very own watershed in the classroom. This was provided to you generously by the Columbia County Stormwater Utility Department. Your watershed supplies should include a disposable nine by 13 baking pan, 12 inches of wax paper, a spray bottle, which you will need to fill with water, a yellow and blue washable marker, a sponge, which will represent a permeable surface, which is a surface that easily absorbs water, and a small Ziploc bag full of pollutants. These pollutants are represented by brown sprinkles, which are pet waste, oats, which represent trash, and green sugar, which represents fertilizers. First, you will gently crumble up the sheet of wax paper. Make sure the ball isn't too tight. You will unfold the wax paper a bit and place it into the pan to create a watershed. Next, using the blue and yellow washable markers, mark different sources of pollution onto the landscape. You can mark at the top of ridges or mountains or down into places that may represent lakes. Next, you'll want to scatter your Ziploc bag full of pollutants onto the landscape. Put them evenly throughout the landscape in different areas. Next, you'll use the spray bottle to create rain over the landscape. As the rain falls onto the landscape, you'll notice that your markers and your pollutants represented by the sprinkles, sugar, and oats will start to flow into different places. Using a pencil and paper, make some observations about where your pollution traveled and what pollution ended up where. If you have time, you may want to empty out your watershed and start again putting different kinds of pollutants in different places in your watershed. Take some notes and then your teacher will guide you through some questions about what you have observed. We hope you enjoy building your very own watershed. And teachers, don't forget to take a couple of pictures and send them via the Google form so that your class can get extra clover points this month by building their own watershed.
A watershed is a basin-like landform defined by high points, ridge lines, and valleys that are created by the surrounding landforms. Landforms are a result of a combination of constructive and destructive forces. Constructive forces build up features on the surface of the earth. These include mountains through the process of deformation and deltas through deposition. Destructive forces break down features on the earth's surface, like the creation of canyons through the processes of weathering and erosion.